Good evening across America and around the world. I'm William Cooper, and yes, folks, my voice is once again failing. I beg your patience and your forgiveness. But don't worry about me. Remember Randy Weaver and pray for those under siege by federal forces in Waco, Texas. They have committed no crime. They have broken no law. The Hour of the Time is brought to you tonight by Swiss America Trading. In 1976, folks, we had an economy struggling out of recession. We had low interest rates, cheap gold, and depressed hard assets. We elected a president that was a southern liberal Democrat governor, a Washington outsider. He had an ultra-liberal running mate, promised to tax big corporations, promised more, better jobs, and use more government spending to stimulate the economy. Well, all this sounds very similar to the president we just elected, doesn't it? Between 1976 and 1980, the inflation rate soared to double digits. Wise investors sought the protection of gold and silver, which ultimately went up over 500%. Now, if you feel that paper assets will be safe for the next four years, ignore this offer. If your assets are protected against high inflation, high interest rates, a possible currency recall, or government collapse, then relax. You've got nothing to worry about. If you feel the government is going to look out for your best interests, then don't call. But if you're like me, William Cooper, and many, many others who have really looked at the economy of this country and really understand who and what the Federal Reserve represents and the real purpose of the Internal Revenue Service, then call Swiss America Trading at 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. And have the experts there show you how you can protect yourself. Call 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. And mention my name, William Cooper, for a free newsletter on protecting your future. Call today. Call right now. 1-800-289-2646. Four, six. And tell them William Cooper sent you. The siege continues in Waco, Texas. A small group of American citizens exercising their rights under Article I of the Constitution, which gives them freedom of religion, and their rights under the second article and amendment to the Constitution, which gives them the right to keep and bear arms. They have committed no crime. They have broken no laws. They are resisting alone, overwhelming odds, in an attempt to stop the encroaching totalitarian socialist state that we will all know as the New World Order. on the other end of the line here with me is Mr. Gary Hunt, who's been in Waco, Texas since shortly after the beginning of this month and has been following everything that's been happening there. And we're going to get his version of what he's seen, what he's heard uh, from the people that he's talked to, the uh, experiences that he's had with the law enforcement agencies and uh, those people known as Branch Davidian who are still held hostage by federal stormtroopers in Waco, Texas. Gary, welcome to the Hour of the Time. 
Thank you, Bill. Uh, what can you tell us about the situation as it stands right now? Well, right now, the siege continues. The optimism of the Brest Davidians is uh, higher than it has been in, in uh, the, the first 10 days of the siege, at least. Uh, I think they're becoming aware that America is behind them, or at least the people of America. How are they finding this out, Gary? Are they? Uh, do they have a shortwave radio? Do they have regular radios? Are, are they able to hear uh, what's going on outside that compound? We know at least that they're uh, picking up KGBS uh, out of Dallas, a, an AM station, and that they are picking up the press conferences that are held every morning at 1030. Great. Well, they do have uh, a lot of support out here for from patriots who really understand what this is all about and that it really is the second battle in, in a war that's being fought against the American people. Uh, why did you go to Waco, Texas, Gary? Well, Sunday, February 28th, a friend of mine from Kerrville, Texas, called me and asked me if I knew what was occurring in, in Waco. Uh, at the time, about 11.30 Florida time, I did not. The events here had just begun unfolding. I called a local TV station, uh, Channel 10, which had covered the original siege, and in speaking with the reporter there, as he was reading off the monitor, he kept referring to the cult. However, in a casual conversation, he mentioned that they were a sect. I realized then that something was beginning to influence the press. Uh, and the story sounded quite a bit like what happened last August up in Idaho. I continued to follow that through Thursday of that first week. And by then I realized that something was occurring down here that was going to significantly affect American history or the course of our country for some time to come. Uh, by Saturday then I, had, I was prepared to leave my business and come out here for the duration. I did not expect at the time that it would be nearly this long, but I wanted to see firsthand what was happening and attempt to affect that if I could. I've been out here since and I do plan on staying until this is over. Well, I commend you for that, Gary, and I think there should be many more people down there lending support to those people. And I firmly believe that if two or three million Americans would show up and just very quietly stand unarmed around that compound, that the, that the, uh, the, the siege would have to be lifted at that point and there would have to be a congressional investigation call. However, I don't give too much hope that that's going to happen. Uh, but we'll we'll have to wait and see. What happened when you got there? What was the first thing that you did? Well, one of the ideas that I had uh, when I came here between Thursday and Saturday when I flew out, uh, in fact, I had drawn up uh, instructions, uh, was to do exactly what you just mentioned. I had been told by some people that first uh, Saturday when I left that there would be between 200 and 500 people here. And then Sunday morning, that number, that number that I've been told, had raised to 900 people. As it was, about 80 people showed up in Waco. And out of those 80, 20 were willing at one point to go out and physically enter the uh, unarmed, but to enter the conference area and camp out between the uh, bad forces and the, uh, the Camp Davidian Church. Uh, by the time we were ready to go, that had dwindled to perhaps three of us still willing to do this uh, as, as they discussed the potential risk of going against the army out there. Well, that's that's what happens when, the, when, when things get down to real nitty-gritty, real protecting your country. All of these people out there willing to send their sons and daughters off to die in the Sahara Desert or someplace in the Middle East so George Bush and all the other oil people can keep their oil and get rich, but when it comes to stand up and protecting their own country, they just melt away into the darkness. Why does that happen? If people would, would stop and think what is happening here in Waco, that the Branch Davidians are the, perhaps the only patriots in this country. Right now, with their very lives, they're defending every door in this country. And very few of us are willing to offer them any assistance in that effort. That's correct. You know, with your effort, uh, there's not a door in this country that's not uh, susceptible to being broken down by the same stormtroopers that have attempted to break down their door. Absolutely. And I believe that uh, if the people of the United States lose this battle, because the, the, the people in this compound that are surrounded and being held under siege 
are fighting a battle for all of us, all of our rights and freedoms, all of our creator endowed rights, all of the protections given to us uh, by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And if we lose this battle, if we lose this battle, I believe that that will signify the end of the United States of America as we have traditionally known it and will give the total go-ahead for the New World Order to persecute, to, uh, to hound, to confiscate, to murder uh, whoever and whatever they will. What do you feel about that, Gary? Oh, I feel the same. I've equated the events down here. Uh, Randy Weaver was a, a small family. He was lost in the press. Uh, Wake was not. We're all aware of this. This is I equate with Lexington and Concord. Absolutely. The issues are similar. We've got the opposing army. Uh, we've got the uh, attempt to, to secure the weapons that were stored in Concord back uh, 220 years ago. Uh, the, the British have come, and the defenders are, are standing there. Uh, if, if we think back of those, uh, I guess, about 100 Americans, the first Americans, they stood against the British troops. Had they uh, not been willing to, to give their lives for a cause, then we wouldn't have what uh, was once the greatest nation in the world and, and could be again if we can develop the same spirit and willingness to defend our neighbors as we would like them to defend us that, that made this great administration. Well, President Roosevelt once said, uh, the way to end this problem is to put a chicken in every pot. And what he meant by that is if we can just give everybody something to eat, they'll be happy, and there won't be any rebellions, there won't be any uh, uprisings, there won't be any dissension, and we can go ahead and institute whatever kind of government we want. Do um, you think the American people have bought into that? Oh, I think they have. I think that Roosevelt forgot to tell them how much that chicken was going to cost. <laughs> well, we're finding out now, aren't we? What started this thing, Gary? What happened in Waco, Texas? Or, or let's go back a little bit further. I remember the first press conference that I saw on television after they had lost uh, four, I believe it was four, uh, BATF uh, agents to uh, the gunfire from the compound. Uh, they said that they were there because a foreign agent or a foreign person from some other country had informed the State Department that the members of Branch Dominion in Waco, Texas were preparing to commit mass suicide, much as the Jonestown uh, mass suicide had occurred in Guyana. Um, is, is that what you believe started all this off? Well, I have not heard that uh, story. Uh, the story that I've heard down here is that uh, there was an investigation over illegal weapons. Uh, that that uh, investigation had gone on for the eight months. The sheriff of the county, Jack Harwell, had participated in the investigation. He had also explained to the, the BATF that, uh, that in 1986, when uh, David Cross was charged with attempted murder, that there were a number of weapons that were subsequently, after the mistrial, returned to David Cross. But the investigation had gone in eight months uh, that uh, the last, uh, I think, uh, two months were spent in training down in Fort, Fort Hood for the actual assault itself. Uh -huh. uh, there were three warrants. One was an arrest warrant and two were search warrants. Those are still sealed, uh, so we don't know what the purpose was. Uh, the DATF, early on when they were more cooperative with me, uh, did say that it was an illegal weapon uh, arrest and that the warrants were, or one of the warrants at least, the search warrants was for illegal weapons. Uh, well, we've heard a number of stories since then. We have uh, subsequently heard allegations of mass suicide. Those disappeared very quickly when reality or common sense. Uh, well, of course, if they're going to commit mass suicide, they would have already done it. I mean, what what more opportune time when the whole world is looking looking at them? Uh, that's just absolutely absurd. If they haven't committed mass suicide by now, then they never intended to in the first place. Um, the uh, what we saw was on the network news, and it specifically stated that the State Department had received word from a foreign source that uh, they were going to commit mass suicide. Now. 
right off the bat, I knew that that was a lie, because if that was true, there's no federal law against committing suicide. Federal troops have no authority, jurisdiction, or anything else there. But yet they sent the FBI and the BATF, which is, for those of you out there who may not understand what that means, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and they physically raided the place with SWAT team and anti-terrorist units uh, without even uh, trying to uh, go through the motion of picking this guy up. We know for a fact that uh, he goes into Waco once a week and eats in the same restaurant at the same table uh, every night, uh, you know, at that time, every week, uh, at, at the same time. And if they really wanted him, all they had to do was wait for him to go in and pick him up by himself. We also know he's always cooperated with local officials, and whenever they've asked him to come in and speak to them, He's uh, never hesitated to do it. So why do you think that uh, if they were after him, why do you think they waited till these people were having uh, their religious service and then raided them during the middle of, of that? Well, we know from the New York Times article on Sunday and subsequent answers by the uh, FBI and ATF in the press conferences uh, that there was an element of surprise involved that they had moved the raid up, and they called it a raid from the beginning, not an arrest, but a raid. Uh -huh. uh, they, they, they moved it up uh, from Monday the 1st to Sunday the uh, 28th uh, to maintain the element of surprise. Uh, they probably picked Sunday, uh, hoping that everybody would be in a prayer service or a Bible reading or something so that they could uh, come in the second floor windows with their automatic German rifles. And, uh, would be able to secure the, the conflict with uh, virtually no resistance. But Gary, in, in light of their statements that they're only after Koresh, and it's on a, uh, and, and first it was because they're all going to commit mass suicide, and then they were cited as being terrorists uh, on news conferences. They called them terrorists, but we know they didn't go after them because they're terrorists, because they've never terrorized anybody. And now they're talking about federal firearms violations, and uh, this is, uh, 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 they were after Koresh to do this. Why did they raid the compound when everybody was, was there? Why didn't they wait until they could get Koresh alone and avoid this whole scenario? Well, I think that there was a motivation behind that. Uh, the only logical conclusion I can come to is this was a training exercise in, in what they intend to be doing all over the country. And the reason they had so many people uh, was probably the, the benefit of uh, training 100 to 120 uh, troops in, in one on-the-job training experience, how to break down doors and arrest large amounts of people uh, with, uh, with a massive force. Well, I, I think you're right on there. I think that's exactly why they did it. I think they wanted resistance. I think they wanted to create an incident. I think they wanted to make Christians look bad. I believe that they wanted to make anybody who owns a firearm look bad, even though that right is protected under the Constitution, and religion is protected under the Article One of the Constitution, and, and a lot of other things. Um, what have you found out since you've been there, Gary? What's the truth about what's happening according to what you know and what you've found out? Well, the, the, the truth is best I can tell is not what the uh, ATF and FBI tell us. Uh, they're constantly changing the stories. Uh, I do think the truth uh, lies fundamentally in what you said. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, I think, uh, told us many years ago that the Constitution should be preached from every pulpit. Now, if they don't want the Constitution in this country, obviously they've got to destroy the pulpit. And it's easy to make a man like David Koresh, who has a very strong following, uh, look evil. Uh, and so they felt that they could uh, go in with allegations of child abuse, uh, the Jonestown scenario, which uh, was brought up a couple of weeks ago and dropped very rapidly when they realized how foolish it was. It might have been the second time it's that occurred. And we now know all these things are false, but there are millions of Americans out there who watch their television and read their newspaper, and they believe anything the authorities tell them because they don't believe that the authorities would ever lie to them, even though they find out every year that they, that they do. Uh, for instance, we know that, uh, that Koresh is not a polygamist. We know that he has one wife. Is that correct? My understanding is he has one wife. And he has two children, also according to what we've discovered. Is that correct? 
and I'm not sure how many children he's got. I do understand that, uh, uh, that one of his daughters, a two-year-old daughter, was killed in the initial assault. That's what we understand also. She was in the nursery, and uh, the VATF people were firing blindly into the nursery after they threw a, a gas grenade in there. Well, they continue to assert that they are trained to pick their targets. Oh, they always I assume that that's true. Why would they want to kill a two-year-old girl? That's correct. Absolutely. Why? Uh, the truth is, it, is that they probably weren't picking t uh, targets at all. They, uh, our information is that they were firing blindly um, into the nursery and couldn't see because anyway because of the uh, the cloud of gas from from the gas grenades. And we do have some video showing too a curtain being pulled back and. Uh the, the stormtrooper could not pull it down, and obviously they did not stick their head in, heads in to observe what was inside. Mm -hmm. But then uh, after a short gap, there was smoke coming out as if a flashbang were thrown in that room. Uh, that seems rather indiscriminate to me, and when you consider the potential for damage from a flashbang or a percussion uh, grenade, uh, uh, there is video evidence of lack of discrimination in, in their assault. Absolutely. Um, have, have the uh, federal agents taken any means to suppress the truth of what's going on? Uh, have they confiscated videotape? Have they done? Uh, have they threatened uh, news reporters? Anything like that? Well, there are a number of abuses along that line. Uh, let's see. We'll start at the beginning. We do know that Channel 10 had two newsmen that covered uh, two cameramen that covered the initial assault, and those were the videos that were seen at first, but have not been seen more than, uh, after the first showing. My understanding of talking with a number of people uh, is that those were seized by the FBI as evidence. We, the FBI, or the ATF, I'm sorry, the ATF has admitted that they had at least one camera rolling during the entire event. event. Uh, obviously, again, a training exercise, and they wanted to show how to do it. Uh, I'm sure they won't use it for training in the future, but that, uh, again, is secured as evidence. Uh, Mr. Lewis Bean was down here. Uh, Two, uh, two weeks ago Saturday, I think it was. He, under legal press, press credentials, was in the press conference and he asked a big question. <laughs> he asked very big question was something to the effect that uh, can we take it by the Gestapo tactics that we used in this way that this is the beginning of a police state in America? Well, he was escorted out of the uh, press conference and has never returned. You mean he was escorted out? There was no answer given? There was uh, apparently a bubble stutter answer, but no concrete answer. And the rest of the press corps just stood there and allowed this to happen without protest? That's correct. Well, I, I've come up with the terms since I've been here. I used to refer to them as establishment press. Now I call them bubble press because they, no matter how complex the news, they've got to encapsulate that in a two-minute bubble. I think they're a pack of miserable, traitorous cowards who haven't got the backbone or the balls to stand up and do what they know is right. They've sold themselves to somebody, I don't know who or why, and for what. I mean, journalists don't even get paid that much. Why would they go along with this? You know, I think some of it is pressure. Uh, I have a legitimate newspaper. I have gone to the press conference uh, four days in a row, and then on a Thursday, uh, the Thursday after Lewis Bean was in there, I was uh, stopped at the uh, door and taken over to a side room and they asked me a number of questions uh, about my newspaper and uh, questioned the legitimacy of it. Finally, they uh, agreed that it was legitimate. I'm not sure what legitimate newspaper means, but they determined that it was legitimate and allowed me in. It was on Thursday. I went to the press conference on Friday. Saturday night, Saturday I did not go, but Saturday evening there was a bit of an incident out uh, at the press site near the conference. Uh, complex. As a result of that, I was under the credentials of AEN out of Indiana. They had uh, an agreement with me for, for me to go out with them to cover a, a portion of the story and look at the press site near the complex. It was the only time I've been there. Uh, and exiting, we were told that they were falsified credentials and interrogated uh, by the FBI and finally released. On Sunday, I was not allowed in the press conference. And from Sunday to Friday, I kept trying to get an explanation as to why I was not allowed, uh, because my credentials had been proven legitimate. Uh, only one reporter stood up for my position and said, read this with the Dallas Observer. Mm -hmm. I will say that uh, of all the press people, he is the only one 
that uh, doesn't feel that there are different levels of press, and that virtually every member of the press should be allowed uh, into the press conferences. Well, absolutely. I know that uh, Article 1 of the Constitution of the United States of America makes no... Uh, makes no distinction between uh, different levels of the press. It says that uh, the freedom of the press shall not be uh, infringed. Well, I think one definition of press credentials uh, now, and it is probably correct, is press credentials allow you the right that every citizen should have in this country. That's true. That's very true. Well, let's go to the beginning of this, Gary. Uh, do you think that uh, the people at Branch Davidian knew that this raid was going to occur? They may have. Uh, they have been investigated by a TV uh, program that's more secure them, and I think the same thing is going on uh, up in Montana right now. They have been investigated by the uh, Waco uh, Tribune. Uh, the Waco Tribune broke their story on Saturday, and now the FBI ATF are trying to accuse the uh, Waco Tribune of leaking information to the Branch Davidians. That's kind of interesting. I always liked it when I could tell you a secret, uh, but I did I expected you to have uh, to privilege the secret more than I privileged it myself when I told you. Not only that, it sounds like the Fed is admitting that they were briefing the local news media that something was going to happen. Well, it appears to be, and we understand, too, that in Oklahoma right now, uh, they have finished the set for a FBI story moving on the raid at Waco. Uh, apparently, that was under construction before the raid began. You mean they were filming a movie? about this particular raid and it was finished before the raid even began? Well, the movie was, the set was under construction when the raid began. Oh, I see. They were they were building a set to film a movie about this raid before the move, before the raid ever began. That's my understanding. I think that that's been confirmed uh, in the press conferences. This is incredible. So, uh, uh, as far as the secret, uh, the FBI and ATF, or the ATF only at that time, expected other people to respect the, the secrecy of the secret, but uh, they could not respect it themselves. But it was <laughs> common knowledge. Now, also, Delby, the city, uh, well, the, the branch division complex is near Elk, which is a, a, a fork in the road, but Delby is a, a little town just down the road from them that the ATF forces suited up in, right off the main road, Highway 84, in the uh, uh, city uh, parking area, uh, uh, the Civic Center, uh, that morning. Uh, so here's uh, between 80 and 120 people putting on their back black battles here. In a small town where anything unusual travels by word of mouth like lightning. <laughs> right, or even by telephone. Sure. Uh, so uh, by going public two hours before the raid when they were suiting up, uh, there's not a high degree of secrecy that they could anticipate. Well, I don't think that they wanted any secret, Gary. I think that they wanted to ensure there would be armed opposition. I think that they wanted a show here to try to convince the American people, number one, that Christians are fanatical lunatics, and number two, anybody that owns a weapon is dangerous to everybody else. Well, when we were kids, we used to play with firecrackers, and every once in a while we got one with a fast fuse and ended up with sore fingers, and I think that's what kind of happened here. They certainly are going to have some sore fingers. They expected that there would be casualties on the other side, perhaps their own side. Uh, that's evidenced by the fact that they did not advise their own uh, people of what to expect, that there might be automatic weapons, and whether there are or not, we still have to determine. That's true. Because we do have, we uh, don't hear any automatic fire uh, at all, so it's hard to tell if there was full automatic fire. Well, I can tell you from my experience in Vietnam is that unless a person has been practicing and using an automatic weapon for some time, that they usually never can hit anything, and most uh, people who fire automatic weapons who haven't been using them and aren't expert with them uh, and haven't uh, been firing them for quite some time, uh, usually uh, expend all the ammunition shooting at the moon. So the fact that four BATF uh, officers and several others were wounded, or four were killed and several others were wounded, would tell me that these people in there uh, 
either have had a hell of a lot of practice with automatic weapons, and I don't believe that they have any, number one, or number two, were just good shots who were protecting something that they held dear, so they made sure that their bullets counted. Um, let's go to the beginning of this, Gary, and uh, how did all this come about? What, what happened? Oops, I'm sorry, we can't do that. Uh, Gary, hold on, we've got to take a short break. Folks, don't go away. We'll be right back after this pause. How did all this come about? What, what happened? As far as what? Well, you've already told us that they came into town and, and uh, were suiting up hours before the thing happened, and that obviously the press uh, knew what was going to happen uh, because they accused the press of warning these people. Uh, so this this whole thing was planned well in advance. Uh, press were obviously briefed. They came in early that day and uh, suited up in plain view of all the townspeople, which is just asking uh, for these people to be warned. And then uh, what did they do? Well, the, uh, the Channel 10 newsmen were present at the site before the ATF rolled in. So, so that proves a, a prior briefing, without any shadow of a doubt. Right, and the ATF people were, were friendly uh, towards the press people at that point in time. The Waco Tribune was out there. Uh, the Waco Tribune vehicle was run over by a Bradley later on, allegedly pushing it out of the road. It was slapped like a pancake. But originally, uh, early on, before... Uh, it unfolded the way it did. There was a, a, an agreeable nature to the ATF forces towards the press. After the ATF got their backside shot up as badly as they did, uh, they were very antagonistic towards the press, as was evidenced by the Waco Tribune vehicle being rolled over and some of the attitudes uh, that are seen on some of the videos uh, of the angry voices towards the press. They got caught. Uh, Things went wrong, they got caught, and they didn't like the idea of this being public, all of a sudden it didn't go their way. Well, they're obviously extremely embarrassed, as they should be. Uh, so so how did they get in there? What 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 started all this thing off? Well, as near as I can tell, uh, we're talking with the people here in the original video that was apparently just one time on Channel 10. The ATF vehicles rolled up into the complex area. The bad forces jumped out of the vehicles then and began running towards the building. Some were hiding behind their vehicles. Apparently they did have a plan and, and people have objectives. There were at least two cattle trucks with tarps. Out of those trucks jumped stormtroopers with ladders, aluminum ladders. They ran up and began climbing up to the, uh, the rooftops to enter serve arrest papers through second story windows. Uh, now, my understanding at that point is that uh, David Forrest came outside. Now, there are three pieces of evidence that we have that uh, kind of support this. Sharon Wheeler, that first week, was saying we were outgunned. Uh, they had guns that could shoot through doors. We did not. Uh, about a week later, Bill, uh, Bob Ricks from the FBI stated that David Corsh ran back inside, slammed the door, and then they began firing inside the complex. Now, why would you say they have guns that could shoot through doors and we do not? Well, uh, the only thing that I don't quite understand that, uh, I'm not sure, I understand there were M-16s, probably, possibly AK-47s inside. Uh, there's no indication that there was any 50 caliber uh, machine gun or semi-automatic fire from inside. Uh, but uh, the stormtroopers were using the MP5s, which is 9mm German made, and I guess there were some uh, M16s or AR-15s as well, and they were using 9mm pistols. Well, we know that all of those will shoot through a normal door. A normal door. Now, assuming this is still more like a farm, it could have been an inch and a half or two inches of wood in the door. Uh -huh. I don't know why she said that, but it does, it does tell us something. The David Corsh could not have been shot through the door. Yep, sure, we were correct. Well, if she's correct, sounds to me like she was trying to say something that the American people would interpret as meaning that these people had some kind of terrible weapons when when all the indications and, and all of the testimony that, that I've heard and that my 
uh, agents from uh, CAGI, the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence, have heard is that uh, they don't have these kinds of weapons at all. And if they do, they certainly haven't used them yet. Well, the story of 50 caliber was very strong, but then it dropped uh, after I turned out a press release regarding that. I'll get into that in a minute, but I'd like to uh, show how this evidence shows that the ATF must have fired first. Okay, well, we've got Sharon Wheeler stating that they, they could shoot through doors, we could not. And we've got, got Bob Rick saying that uh, David Corrish ran back inside, the people inside then began firing. Well, David Corrish, we know, was shot in the side and neither the arm or the hand. He uh, received two shots. Uh, presumably, they must have happened before he went back inside because then he was inside the fortified building. Uh, so I think we've got an omission on the part of Mr. Wilson that he failed to uh, mention that the ATF had opened fire before David ran back inside. <clears throat> there was a statement earlier on when David was allowed access to one of the local uh, radio stations where uh, he was obviously in pain from the injury, but he was saying, I'd gone outside to see what had happened. Uh, they had their guns out. I said, don't shoot, don't shoot. They shot me and I ran back inside. So we put all three of these together, and I, said, I think there can be little doubt that the ATF uh, began firing. Now, speaking with the people here who saw the early videos, they have estimated uh, to me that between a couple dozen and a couple hundred shots were fired by the ATF before the people from inside began firing. This conforms to all the information that we received from everyone that we've talked to. Uh, before we continue, Gary, uh, there's been all this stuff in the news in the newspapers that uh, Korish uh, claims that he's Jesus Christ. Is that, does he really do that? Well, I have never met anybody or heard him on any of the broadcasts that they've given say that he was Jesus Christ. We've never, we have not been able to find anyone who's ever heard him say that either. In fact, we have found people who don't even like him or his church who say that he's never said that he's Jesus Christ, uh, even though they don't like him and don't like his church. Um, go ahead, continue. I think he might say in a symbolic sense that uh, he represents Christ, but uh, then I compare that to the, the, uh, the Pope of the Catholic Church who, who talks with God. And, uh, I don't see that there's much difference except the size of the two religions. Oh, well, well, there's quite a bit of difference. Uh, the Pope claims that he is God and that he's Christ's vicar on earth. And uh, uh, But be that as it may, I, I don't... Uh, get the ATF to go to the Vatican. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? Uh, what happened next? Well, uh, the the next significant event was uh, the VATF uh, obviously got their backside kicked. Uh, something totally unexpected. They had four dead. How many wounded? Sixteen wounded. Four dead and sixteen wounded. Sixteen wounded. Now, uh, what they did then is made a plea to David Corse to allow them to move their dead and wounded from the battlefield. Yes. And David Corse, uh, graciously like a good Christian, allowed that to happen. Uh, the ATF, though, then denied medical supplies until the following Saturday, uh, almost a week later, and still would not provide the sort of supplies that David asked for. David and his people do not believe in AMA medicine. Uh -huh. They uh, eat health foods and they believe in health remedies. I have tried uh, to get even the Red Cross involved, and uh, surprisingly, they, uh, even the National Red Cross in Washington refused to cooperate to any degree in attempting to get humane supplies into David Courage that would be health supplies, foods, and remedies. Uh -huh. Uh, so the FBI or the ATF expects the uh, humanitarian situations out of the uh, people inside, but at the same time they deny the same privilege to the people inside. Right, and, and, and then they call them terrorists. Well, they, they must be terrorists. Who else, who else, how else could you justify turning off power and? Uh, uh, no, they call they call the people inside terrorists. Well, they must be terrorists because we, how else could? Uh, the ATF justify cutting off their power. I mean, if we believe the a ATF side, these people are worse than most of the en enemies we've fought in any war because we've always allowed them medical supplies through the Red Cross. So, we, uh, you know, I think we have to assume that the ATF is correct. These people are, are terrorists. Uh, you know, there can be no other answer. 
<laughs> well, there has to be another answer, and, and we got to be careful with what we say over the air uh, if we don't really mean it, simply because there's a lot of people out there whom I really call sheeple who might hear this broadcast and, and believe that you mean verbatim what you're saying right now. Well, let's, let's clarify that. We've got some very humane people inside. Uh, we've had the ATF allege that they are holding their people hostage, uh, but uh, very clearly they've allowed the release of a number of their people to come out. Uh, I say relief, that's a misnomer. Uh, well, we have allowed their people to come out, those who chose to come out, the hostages of the people uh, inside of the uh, complex, the hostage holders of the FBI denying them free access to... That's correct. The, the people inside are armed, and they're not being held hostage by Koresh or anybody else. Uh, they are in there because they want to be in there, and they're standing for principle, and for ideals and for creator endowed rights. Uh, they're standing for the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and they are indeed being held hostage, but by the, the federal government and its uh, agencies acting illegally, in my estimation. And uh, are there military troops there, Gary? Uh, we, I've seen videos and I'm trying to get copies of people in U.S. Army uniforms. Now, we've got some funny circumstances. Uh, just recently in a press conference, the ATF or the FBI in an attempt to justify the use of three National Guard helicopters in the initial assault said that the National Guard was using infrared to determine if there was an amphetamine lab inside of this church. Uh, they did detect a hot spot. Uh, I would assume that hot spot was probably the kitchen because on Sunday morning it would take quite a bit of heat to cook food for 120 mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. um, but that was to justify the National Guard helicopters, so we know they were involved. Uh, the Bradleys apparently were National Guard and were on loan. <laughs> the operators were National Guard or ATF. ATF, one of the press conferences, indicated the reason the Waco Tribune vehicle was run over is that their troopers are not uh, trained in driving badly. <laughs> they brought the uh, tanks up from Fort Hood. My understanding was that the National Guard would not supply drivers for the tanks or the tanks themselves, and that active duty United States Army personnel were brought into this engagement. Now, to my understanding now, we've got the first uh, military vehicles being used against directly against American citizens since the Civil War. In, in what is supposed to be a law enforcement action, and the Constitution and the laws of this land expressly forbid the military in any way, shape, or form from being used for enforcement of the law. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, we, you, you mentioned something, law enforcement. Uh, remember, these used to be peace officers. Now they're law enforcement. They were serving a very simple arrest warrant when I was a kid, I remember the no-knock warrant. Any time a no-knock warrant was issued, the press made a big deal of it. It was a, a rare exception that uh, a no-knock could be issued. It's become a way of life. Um, I mean, there's no-knock. They were entering windows and everything else. Uh, you know, the world has changed a lot in, in, in my lifetime. And uh, to call this law enforcement when they use 120 people to a ser uh, serve an arrest warrant to search warrants, I think we've gone beyond the police state. We've actually stepped over into a military state. Well, that's, that's what I believe, and I think it happened a long time ago, and they're just now uh, letting us know and exercising the powers that they've had by treaty uh, under the United Nations Charter and uh, through the UN Participation Act, the Disarmament Agency, the Disarmament Act, and many, many others um, that people don't know much about but are just beginning to become aware of. Uh, what did you, what have you found out about the, uh, about the way that this was carried out? For instance, you were telling me earlier off the air uh, about the ATF agents pulling aside curtains and throwing something inside. Could you go over that with us? Well, we have a video that uh, was broadcast a few times uh, on the first day and was uh, subsequently edited down considerably. In that video, there are four ATF soldiers climbing a ladder to a window. 
Now that window was identified as map and produced by or drawing produced by ATM to be to their ammunition storage area on the second floor. Uh, it would seem foolish to store ammunition on the second floor. It would seem more practical to store it in an underground bunker. Uh, one of the people that got out later identified that room as David Gorsh's bedroom. Uh, at any rate, these four troopers climbed the ladder, one wise prone facing up the gable roof uh, to protect against anybody coming over the roof. Uh, the other three then are right at the window. One of them begins breaking out the window. Uh, then there's a gap in the video, and uh, then uh, you see a smoke billowing, or, uh, smoke billowing out of the window as if the flashbang were thrown in there, the percussion grenade. And then three VATF agents climbed in the window. Then there's a gap in the film. And then you see a VATF. Now this, one, this next scene is one that you see over and over again. You see a VATF soldier uh, right next to the window uh, with gun in hand facing the window. And then four or five rounds come through the wall behind him. Our full explode uh, in the wall. Then one uh, strikes apparently right by his Kevlar helmet, knocking him down uh, where he lies still on the roof for a few seconds, and then he got up slowly and started moving towards the ladder. Now, I'm not sure if the other three stormtroopers were still inside that room when that occurred. If they were, they must have been killed inside, or they were doing firing that, that hit the one trooper. Our information is that two of the dead DHF personnel were killed by the Branch Davidians, and two were killed by their own fire. Can you, do you have any confirmation of any of that? No, well, I've been trying to get as much proof of anything as possible, and so I end up relying a lot on the ATF conferences. Uh, we have been told that two were killed on a roof, and two were killed on the ground. In the press conference the other day, there was an officer Williams, or Agent Williams, who uh, apparently was shot, went down, got back up, began firing again, was shot again, and went down. However, Williams' autopsy apparently reports that he was only shot once, and that shot entered the side of his neck and went out the other side. Now, the FBI then, when they described what happened to Officer Williams, is he was behind cover. Now, the difference between cover and concealment is simple. Concealment hides you visually, but doesn't protect you from bullets. Cover is protection from bullets. Uh, if he was undercover and was facing and firing towards the Branch Davidians, it is hard to understand how a bullet went from side to side through his neck. It would not have been exposed to hostile fire, and it appears in the uh, perhaps friendly fire that killed Agent Williams. Hmm. Uh, that is the only one that I can say appears to, from the evidence that I've been able to, to gather, appears to have been a friendly fire casualty. How about children, Gary? Uh, initially, I heard that possibly uh, a number of children were killed in the initial raid. The only one we know for sure would be David Cross's uh, two-year-old daughter. Uh, the videos that have come out in the past few days, the FBI, by their own count, uh, has 12 children. They claim that they have seen pictures of five other children. Uh, that so, so according... Children are supposed to be inside, and one of those 15 children is supposed to be dead. So I don't know if the other five exist or not. Uh -huh. Some of the rumors here, which since one of the areas attacked was the children's living quarters and nursery area, uh, some of the people believe here that perhaps more children were killed by the discriminant fire, as the uh, ATF calls it. Uh, they're supposed to pick their targets before they fire. Uh, apparently, they were, did pick at least one child, perhaps more. To be okay. Well, Gary, uh, what do you think is going to transpire in the next few days? Well, a lot of progress has been made. When I first got here, I spoke with Commander Maurice Cook of the Texas Rangers and asked him, well, with Eric Leiter and uh, Nancy LaRosa, we did uh, file a criminal complaint against the uh, Texas Rangers and the sheriff and serve them. Uh, for failure to perform their jurisdiction uh, duty. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, shortly after that, I spoke to Commander Cook, and he told me that politically he was not allowed to get involved in this. And I told him what my objectives were, and that was uh, first to save lives, and uh, second to uh, make sure that justice was served. But, but he politics would allow, he would uh, take over the investigation and or jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, this morning I spoke to Commander Cook, uh, Winston, uh, Tuesday morning, I spoke to Commander Cook, and he assured me I had heard from the FBI that, uh, that the investigation jurisdiction has been turned over to them. He did confirm that uh, when the time comes for the investigation, that the Texas Rangers will conduct the investigation. He assured me that if they, people walked out right now, he would have Rangers on the scene within 10 minutes. Uh, he assured me that they would make every effort to make sure that there is no destruction or tampering or creating of evidence. And I feel very comfortable that Commander Cook understands the implications uh, and the potential. I have sent a copy of, of the Mountain of Lies to him so he understands what happened in Idaho. And I feel very comfortable, at least now, that justice will be served when this is over. Uh, we do have to assume that there will be a subpoena power that will get the video uh, and that perhaps we will find out that the crime was not committed by the people inside, but in fact committed by the ATF forces and self the complex. Well, all the information that we've gleaned is that that's exactly what happened, that the, the, the only crimes that were committed have been committed by the FBI and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Uh, now, the information that we have gleaned so far that we've already done in one show has come partly from uh, Nancy LaRosa and uh, her friend whom you mentioned, Eric Leiter. Eric Leiter, and several of the residents who live in the vicinity. Are you go- How long are you going to stay on the scene, Gary? As long as the FBI is here, I'll be here. Well, that may be for some time now. Uh, do you see any signs of the people inside the compound weakening? No, in fact, uh, let me relate something rather interesting. I'm a Vietnam veteran as well, and uh, I think we both understand what uh, what might be called peace mentality. Yes. Uh, when you're under fire and there's no relief in sight, and uh, you're uh, surrounded by outnumbered, uh, armed, that there's a futility and a frustration. Uh, on Monday the 8th, and, uh, we heard David Korsh, uh through the FBI, uh, claiming that uh, he could blow a badly 50 feet in the air. I think it might have been a ploy by the FBI to plant the idea that there might be explosives in there, but at any rate, uh, there appeared to be a, a seized mentality inside the frustration. On uh, Tuesday uh, morning on the Ron Engelman show, or KGBS in Dallas, a radio station that we know they listen to, uh, Ron Engelman uh, and I had worked out uh, an attempt to to get some communication out of the complex. The previous Friday, the 5th, they had worked in determining if there was a need for medical supplies. Um, I was introduced as being a land surveyor and the editor of the newspaper, and that I was why I was there. Um, and then uh, a series of questions were posed, and there's a single question if you want somebody to come in, would you promise your uh, guarantee Gary on safety if he came in? Do you want somebody that's not as affiliated with law enforcement? Somebody was looking for a peaceful solution. The antenna was rotated, which was the signal to, uh, for an affirmative answer that was worked out the previous Friday. Uh, the second question posed then was to grant Gary Hunt a uh, power of attorney to represent you and to enter the conference. And again, this time it was described as vigorous movement of the antenna. And uh, we feel that the power of attorney was made by that that has not been denied by anybody at this time. Less than two hours, or one of the discussions also included in using a white sheet to indicate, uh, the window to indicate uh, things. But within two hours, the first sign came out and it read, uh, God help us send in the press. Uh, we saw optimists come out of the complex for the first time and virtually broke the uh, siege mentality uh, and broke the FBI's efforts to uh, oppress these people in this mission. And their optimism has stayed up since then. Uh, Dick DeGurian, a, uh, an attorney from Houston, has gone in the last two days to speak with David Corrish. 
Uh, there still is no indication that they're ready to surrender. Uh, we're hoping that uh, the things will change. I've spoken with Melvin Bellas office, and uh, he's got a representative coming out here, and I think he'll be working with us. Uh, I'm Dick DeGurian is uh, just a bar attorney, and uh, Melvin Belli is, uh, is known his reputation for being a fighter. We discussed jurisdiction. Uh, we, you know, I can't discuss our tactics at this point. Uh, but I nor, think, nor should you. <laughs> but I do think that there is a possibility that even more justice can prevail if, if we can uh, get involved and in, in get in and speak to Mr. Floyd. And that's what our efforts will be. Well, Gary, we thank you, and we wish you luck, and we'll be checking in with you from time to time, as well as with our other CAGI members who are down in Wakefield, Texas, covering events as they happen. Until next time, folks, good night, and God bless you all. And to all of the hostages in the compound known as Branch Davidian, God bless you, and keep you safe. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm.